Hello, everybody. Um, so I have this Who Am I slide, but I got such a wonderful introduction that I, I don't really need it. Um, but uh, just to clarify, I am one of many research directors. A, 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 I'm a regional research director for the Austin office for NCC. So with that clarification uh, out of the way, I'd like to start by talking about the most uh, common physical security bypasses that we see when evaluating the physical security of an organization. Um, so these are the things that come up all the time, and you would expect to see lock picking on this list, right? You know, you'd expect to see um, that picking locks was effective, but in most cases, it's not a realistic attack vector. There are absolutely cases where lock picking is definitely on the table, but um, there's this great quote from this very smart Israeli cryptographer named Adi Shamir, uh, which in which he says that um, cryptography is not typically uh, penetrated, but rather bypassed. Um, and there is this great um, physical analogy um, from Schneier and a couple other folks talking about the same sort of thing with cryptography where, you know, uh, you've probably seen a vault door um, and, you know, at a bank or something, or you've at least seen them in movies. And uh, imagine that you have one of those uh, to a tent, like a vault door on a tent. And everybody's arguing about how thick the steel should be, and they're looking at the vault door and not at the tent. Um, so as it turns out, there's a big analog between cryptography and physical security in that way, in that everybody's focused on the thing that's supposed to do the security, right? That's supposed to be, you know, like uh, the lock itself. If the lock is not good, then the physical security is not good. And if it is good, then it's fine, right? You, bet, you buy the best locks, and your physical security is fine. Well. Unfortunately, that's not the case. You can't just buy your way out of the problem. So there's, um, for instance, uh, under the door and, and around the door manipulation is a term I'll be using to describe this sort of series of attacks. The most common attacks are under the door because that's frequently where there's no uh, warding in place. Um, so uh, being able to slip tool through a, a small crevice uh, it seems like not a big deal, but as it turns out, that's a very good avenue to opening doors you shouldn't be able to. So uh, a lot of doors uh, allow you to exit without using a key or other, or, or you know, some key analog like an ID card, uh, an RFID card. Um, but you know, on the way in, they require that that authenticator, that physical authenticator. But if you can just trigger the mechanism from the other side of the door, from the sort of like insecure side of the door, the external side, um, you can bypass the lock entirely. So if you take a look at the doors in this conference room, for example, uh, these have crash bars on them. Uh, I don't know what locks might be on these, but you can notice if you take a close look at the bottom there, there's something like a half inch, maybe a little bit more, um, and you can easily imagine a tool fitting under there. Now this particular tool, hooks onto the top of the crash bar between the door and the crash bar right about here. And then there's a string that you pull to depress the crash bar and the door becomes unlocked because the assumption is that if you can depress the crash bar, you must be on the inside. So you might think, well, it's a good thing that my doors have handles on them. Well, bad news. There's a tool for that as well. I haven't seen one for doorknobs, but I wouldn't be surprised if it exists. The point is, um, Here's another example. So you have this tool that it's, it's kind of looks like this. And you slip it under the door and tilt it until it's on the handle. And then you have a string coming off of this end that you pull down. And it pulls on the handle. And this can be done rather quickly. And the reason is that uh, the handle's on the same side, uh, at the same height and on the same side of the door for any door with this sort of handle system. So you can take your tool and line it up on the side of the door that you're on, the locked side and then see when you're on the handle, about the middle of the handle, where's the bottom of the tool? You put the tool under the door, put that, that spot, that, that tool in the same spot of the door, and then lean it over, and it will fall right onto the handle. And then you can pull down. This takes less than a minute if you practice with the tool for an hour or two. So it's a very easy tool to use once you know how to do it properly, and it's very, very effective. So. You can, you can mitigate this somewhat cheaply um, by having a weather strip, for it, like weather protection, like draft protection. Um, because this also has the added benefit 
of blocking such a tool from getting under. Um, the more expensive fix would be to, you know, raise the, um, I haven't got the word right now, so the thing that goes under the door. The threshold, thank you, yes. Raise the threshold. Um, some, you know, put some sort of wooden or, or concrete uh, uh, platform to raise the threshold. Um, but if you have weather stripping, that actually works to make this attack a lot harder. Now, we've seen it work successfully, um, but there is one problem. Uh, if you have the kind that's sort of brushed, um, then obviously that's not going to stop a tool like this from going through. You would need some solid sort, like uh, on the left there. Uh, you can also make your own sort of weather stripping. There's enough DIY uh, instructions out there. And depending on how you make it, uh, it might be enough to stop a tool like this from going through because it still fills that gap. Um, now, something like this, obviously, you can usually just take a razor pen and cut it open and then get the tool underneath. But then you notice your weather stripping is gone and it's pretty obvious that something happened unless somebody makes you know, the same weather stripping. So at least you have a little bit of a chance to detect it. And this is basically free. The weather stripping is a little bit, little bit, less, uh, a little bit less free. Um, but there's also a problem. Can anybody spot the problem with the, the picture on the left? How could we get past that? If you can unscrew it, absolutely. And I've actually done that on, on an engagement where they had this weather stripping in place, but we just unscrewed it, used the under the door tool, screwed it back in. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But first, I want to show you an amazing little clip um, from a friend of mine. His name is Deviant Olam. And this is about the classiest way that you can breach physical security. Um, so he's wearing a suit, and he's got a glass of whiskey there. And he's going to show you how to break into a bank with whiskey. So door is locked. There's a request to exit motion sensor on the other side. He blows some whiskey through the door, which triggers the motion sensor, unlocks the door, and now you're in. And then the classy way, too. So fantastic stuff. Now, obviously, the, the, the problem here is that the motion sensor, you know, if you can get anything under there, you can trigger it. Now, there are motion sensors which are, are used for requests to exit that um, are a little bit more complicated. There, uh, should I tell the story? Yeah, I should tell the story. So there's this great story from uh, an old boss of mine who, when he did a physical engagement um, for, um, for a company, that they, they'd gone through several iterations. And they kept getting into this request to exit sensor. And so they figured, well, this is the third time, fourth time around, and they still haven't managed to fix this. Let's go in that same way. So they, they try to trigger it you know, with like a, a helium balloon and some surgical tubing slipped under the door. Um, but that doesn't work. So um, what ended up happening is that they have a, a request to exit sensor that, that looks for the shape of a human being. So it's 2 a.m., they need to get in, and they need to have something inflatable that's human body shaped. You know where this is going. <laughs> So they go out to a sex shop, they buy a blow-up doll, and they slip it under the door, they, you know, attach the surgical tubing, and they start inflating it, and it takes a while because it's a lot bigger than your normal balloon. But they, they inflate it all the way, and after a little while, click, door unlocks, they pull it open, and there's a floating blow-up doll and a large number of cleaning staffs looking very confused. <laughs> And uh, all they can think of to say is, hi. <laughs> and then they just, you know, walk in. Now, uh, the funny part about this is that the cleaning staff didn't say a word to their employer about this, but half of them quit. Um, and the, the client was rather upset about this until, you know, uh, my, my boss uh, uh, cleverly quipped that, that you probably don't want a cleaning staff that's not going to tell you about this stuff at all. So it's, is it really that big a loss? And uh, they felt a little bit better after that, but, you know. Anyway, funny story. Um, there are more complicated motion sensors than just this. This is a, a, a very simple one that detects any motion. It doesn't detect heat. It doesn't detect body shape. But those are available, and they are harder to get through. So let's talk about disassembly. Um, so it might be that you have locked some asset which can be disassembled to get at the good part, right? 
So, um, for instance, if you uh, use those laptop locks, um, you know, um, I know that at least with, uh, for instance, the ThinkPad, it's very easy to unscrew two screws, pull out the hard drive, and walk away with it. Because that's the important part, right? That's what you care about. You don't care about the rest of the laptop as much. But the, the laptop is still tethered to, you know, whatever. So that kind of sucks. But anyway, there, here's a, an easy to understand example of that with, with a bike. Now, uh, can anyone tell me how you would open this without the proper key? A screwdriver, that's right. So that's, that's some good, good, you know, decently thick looking metal. It seems like it would be pretty easy to get through. The lock is kind of shit, and you know, if you don't know why, then go see the Longhorn lock picking folks afterwards. They're fantastic. Um, but yeah, we could just unscrew this. So the fix, epoxy that shit. You know, or JB weld it. Just, just make it physically impossible to open. Um, now, there are, of course, downsides to this. Um, if you are worried about somebody pulling the hard drive from your ThinkPad, for instance, you might not actually want to JB weld your, your hard drive bay into the laptop. That, would, that might cause some problems that you don't actually want to deal with because it's much more likely that you'll have to replace a hard drive than to deal with somebody breaking in and stealing your hard drive from a tethered laptop. But, you know, this is the, this is the nearly free option, right? Um, so let's talk about loiting. Um, many of you may have heard of this attack uh, as the credit card trick. Um, has anyone ever tried to use a credit card to open the door in this manner? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, more than just one guy, thank you. Thank you, sir, for being honest. Um, so, what you may not have known is that there is a pin in a lot of, especially commercial doors, which prevents this attack. So, when that pin is depressed, the latch will not be able to, you, you, can't, you can't just push, push the latch in. The, the key needs to be used to operate the latch when that, that, that anti-loiding pin is pushed in. Now, there's a lot of bad installations of these out there where that pin will actually be fully extended into the same place as the latch, which means it might as well not exist. So when you have doors like this, they do need to be installed in a very particular way. Now, uh, I'm sure you are aware also that there are doors like this which do not have this security pin in them. Um, it might be the case that you have a door where if you just shove them forward into the frame or pull it away from the frame, you can get that pin to extend. Or it might be possible that you can take, uh, let's say, a car jack and put it in the door frame and jack it a few times, or take an air wedge. Uh, does anybody, well, we'll just talk about what an air wedge is. An air wedge is used often in, in, um, uh, in, in vehicle uh, recovery, I think is the, the politically correct term. Um, where you take this, basically this bag, this very tough uh, uh, polyurethane, or is it polyurethane? Well, some sort of strong material. I don't know. Some sort of uh, a bag, and uh, usually with like a plastic edge, so you can wedge it in between something. And then you have something like a, like a blood pressure bulb that you use to inflate it, right? And this can be used uh, in conjunction with an under the door tool in case there's a very small amount of space. Um, so you can slip that under there, jack it up, or you know, put it in between the frame and the door and jack it apart so that you can get at this latch or allow the pin to uh, um, retract wouldn't be the right word, extend I suppose. Extend far enough to allow this attack to work again. Um, for those of you curious why it's called loiting, it's because when this uh, first started to be popularized in a series of break-ins in the United Kingdom somewhere, sorry I don't know where, um, but this was uh, commonly done with uh, uh, sheets of celluloid as, you, as are used in some sort of photography process. And please excuse me, I don't know anything about photography, so I don't know how you would use celluloid, but I know it's the right sort of material to use this trick. Now, moving on, some people will try to put a latch guard in front of it. Rather than properly realigning the door, reinstalling the door hardware, uh, but there are ways around this. So 
there's the shove knife, which is pictured in the upper right. And this is, uh, it sounds much, much shadier than it actually is. Or maybe not. I mean, it's pretty shady would you use this for regardless. So, um, so you just sort of uh, go from above the uh, latch guard down with this. And uh, this will you know, perform the same alloiding action. Or you can use dental hygiene. Uh, dental floss is great. It's way stronger than you would imagine it is. Really, really strong. So uh, you can take them out also, like carrying around dental floss. It's just like, well, he really likes his teeth. You know? So you can take this dental floss and maybe a, a safety pin and a magnet, attach the safety pin to the end of the dental floss, and toss it down over the top of that latch and then use a magnet to retrieve it from the door underneath the latch guard. And then you just sort of like floss your way in, right? Um, it helps to be pulling on the handle gently. So if you have somebody else to pull on that while you floss, that will allow it, because it's a pain when you're, you're flossing and then it goes past the latch. It triggers the latch and then goes past the latch and then the latch re-extends and you just like, you have to pull it out and do it again and floss again. So if you can have somebody pulling on the door, it works a lot better. So the real fix for this is to put like a little shim in place. Put a little piece of wood or uh, metal, like whatever, whatever you have available that's, that's sturdy that you can't just like push and cause to flatten and you know, go back to where you were before um, so that the door is properly aligned. And this prevents you from having to reinstall the door hardware entirely. But in the case that it needs to be moved inward, then you just kind of have to reinstall the hardware. And it can be a real pain in the ass. But that's the proper fix. Now, let's say that you can't void it, you can't go under the tool, but all the sort of uh, you know, cracks around the door are properly, uh, properly protected. Well, then you find an alternative entry point. So, um, so on the left, we have a really amusing example, which actually, again, has a problem of disassembly because you know, all, the, all the screws are exposed and you can just unscrew them. But on top of that, literally, you can just pull the drawer above it out and all of a sudden you have access. So um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, a funny and, and a little bit of a clever example. But you know, also, they're just coming in through the window. So I have a nice window creeper picture here on the right. Um, so. Um, windows are typically locked on the first floor, but we don't have to use the first floor. Um, I dream of one day having the tool pictured on the left, which is a grappling hook. Funny enough, it's available for, for only $25, which is probably why I'm still like hung up on this. Um, so <laughs> it is bad, I'm sorry. I'm a dad, I'm allowed to make those jokes though. Anyway. So $25 for that grappling hook, and it has 33 feet of rope. And as they say on the South, Co uh, 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 South Lord website, why 33 feet of rope? We don't know. Anyway, so 33 feet of rope on this grappling hook, $25, and you know, you'll, you have a path up to the roof. So the roof is a potential entry point. And if you assume that that is the inside, that, that, that the roof door is an egress point, not an ingress point, you might have a bad day. Uh, there's also the idea that once you're on the roof, even if there's no roof accessible door, you might be able to rappel down to an open or unlocked window. So uh, this, you know, as a disclaimer, like this is a bit of an exotic attack, you know, like second floor, okay, if somebody brings a ladder, like that's not hard. Grappling hook to the roof and then rappelling down, like, all right, you're probably not going to have to deal with that unless you're like Fortune 5 or something like that. So, you know, don't, don't think that I'm saying, oh, this will happen to you. Like, it's probably not. It's probably not going to happen to you. But it's something to think about, and especially if you work for a very large company. So alternative entry points. The fix for this is really just you have to understand where your entry points are, where your points of ingress are in your organization. So we'll talk a little bit about mapping that out and what things you need to, to look for. But basically, you just kind of have to get a map, get an understanding of your uh, physical location, your office, your whatever, excuse me, uh, your, your, your physical presence, and see what are all the entry points, windows, doors, uh, if you have, a, uh, if you have um, um, particularly large ventilation shaft, maybe, I don't know. But figure out all the places where 
somebody could reasonably enter your building, um, whether locked or unlocked. And then, um, you know, maybe the, the real answer is that you should properly secure all the entry points, or at least the ones that lead to your sensitive assets. Because if you have like a broom closet sitting out uh, with no lock on it, like how much do you really care about those brooms? Probably not much. Whereas if your server room is just sitting out in you know a little closet away from everything where nobody can see it and it's unlocked, well, that's that's obviously a big problem. So the cheap answer is to figure out what your sensitive assets are and what are the most defensible, given your current defenses, what what's the most defensible, hardest to get to place, and join the two. So. Moving stuff around is a lot cheaper than putting additional controls in place. And then you have improper installation. So sometimes all you had would have worked fine if you just didn't fuck it up. So um, <laughs> this one is a bit trickier because there's a lot of ways to fuck things up. So the best advice, general advice that I can give you is read the fucking manual. And then just make sure that whatever defenses you have in place, they're properly configured. In the same way that having an IDS, which is you know, in training mode, is uh, not great, um, not effective. In terms of physical security, you know, having, for instance, a, 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 a latch Lloyd guard that is you know, extended fully is not helping you. It's not doing any favors. So what you should do to start out this process is just figure out first what your assets are. What do you care about somebody messing with or stealing or you know, getting to and then being able to observe? You know? um, if you have secret documents, if you have computer systems, um, you don't want people to be able to mess with those. So that's, those are your sensitive assets, right? So you figure out what those are. And once you've figured out what those are, you figure out what entry points can get me from the complete outside to there. Or, you know, what, what, what access do I need to have as an insider, like somebody who lets me in the front door, where do I, where do I what, what, what entry points do I need to, to get through to get to that sensitive asset? And then figure out, is the lock good? And again, talk to the Longhorn lock picking folks. They can help you evaluate the, the locks. There are some locks that have bypasses for them. Um, so you've, and so should be avoided. There are some that are really stupidly easy to pick, and so lock picking is actually a real concern. Uh, the other thing is when you're talking about something that's not uh, well observed, you know, it doesn't have any cameras on it, no alarms on it, something like that, it, then lock picking becomes more of a threat because it's maybe more time consuming, but with sufficient skill, you know, maybe 30 minutes, an hour isn't out of the question. So, and that's, that's a long period of time, but if it's off in a remote location where you're not going to be disturbed, and you, uh, let's, let's say that you have a parking garage, and you have some parking system, some automated parking system, that ties into the rest of your network. So you find this parking garage, you put on a high-vis vest, and sit there picking the, the cabinet to this parking system, you get physical control over the parking system, compromise it, and then get onto the larger network, you know, you're probably not going to be bothered depending on where it is in the parking garage, right? It's out of the way. You might not even have cameras on you. So, um, but anyway, so having uh, the ability to bypass or destroy the lock, that's, that's also really bad, of course. Um, but, you know, camera and alarm coverage is really important because you need to know if something like this is happening and you need to be able to react to it, to know what was taken, to know what was accessed. So cameras, uh, having that footage is great. But it's also important to remember, you know, uh, how is that transmitted? How is it stored? How is it, you know, like, how is it reviewed? If, if you, there's, there's a simple exercise you can do where you just walk from the outside to some sensitive asset and then go look up your logs, look up your, your, your camera data, and see, like, can you figure out at all, like, where, how, like, can you piece together how that happened? Because if you can't piece together how some physical attack happens in that way, 
then you ha you got a problem, right? So, um, good camera and alarm coverage is really nice because you know all this aside, if if you can get past all this stuff, but you still get noticed, you still trip an alarm, that might be good enough. Um, it 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 takes a lot of attacks that are practical and makes them impractical. So, um, finally, a lot of people. Uh, make the same mistakes with their physical security as they make with their network security, where once you're past the outside perimeter, it's open season. Everyone gets to do everything. You know, there's either no locks on the inside, or they're just pitiful, you know, wafer locks, or everyone has the keys to everything. Uh, I see this a lot in the case of RFID badge uh, locks, where it's, it's an all or nothing thing. They don't have, you know, the sales. Uh, team have you know a certain uh, uh, hi Siri. Um, they don't have a they don't <laughs> Siri. How do I protect my my, my company? Um, uh, so you have um, you have this thing where everybody has access to everything, but your salespeople shouldn't have access to the server room. Probably they they're probably not going to need that. So it's something to think about authorization and free bonus advice. Full disk encryption is great because in the case that you have something like the, the, the example of the ThinkPad, which you, you've chosen not to epoxy the hard drive into, which honestly I'd probably make that same choice. Like that sounds like a pain in the ass. Um, and tethered to, the, tethered to the, the desk, that hard disk of is, is of much less value because now there's an additional hurdle. Somebody needs to crack a password or you know, uh, uh, to, to somehow attack the full disk encryption which most of the time is, is pretty reliable. Um, but even, even if it's not terribly reliable, it still provides a nice hurdle for somebody to have to overcome should they execute a, a successful physical attack. And secondly, third time I'll say it, I'll stop saying it after this, go talk to the Longhorn lockpicking folks. Lockpicking is great fun and it will help you understand locks a hell of a lot better and be able to assess whether or not your locks are any good. So, that's all I've got to say. Uh, so at this point, I'll open it up for audience questions. How do you get started in this line of work? In physical engagement? Yeah. Uh, so I picked up lock picking as a hobby, and then kind of just got lucky in that I was working for a company that needed somebody to do physical stuff, and I was knowledgeable about that. Yeah. Sure. So the first engagement that I did that, that in, included physical work was working on uh, automated teller machines. Um, and those, <laughs> those are fun. Those are fun. Um, there are certain ATMs which, so I'll tell you about a, 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 a set of purely physical attacks on an ATM. Um, there's a, a, a couple different ATMs from a manufacturer that will go nameless. Um, where the back panel is held on with Phillips head screws. Now, the way that an ATM is, is constructed, there's a, a top compartment and a bottom compartment. The top compartment houses the computer, which, uh, which you know, provides the user interface. It provides you know, the card reader and all that sort of thing. And it also communicates with the cash dispenser to tell it, spit out some cash, right? Um, so um, the, the back panel gave you gives you access to the top compartment, but not the safe, which is in the bottom compartment. And in front of the safe, there is a, a beauty door, which is just a nice way of saying it's a little piece of plastic with a dinky little lock. So um, once you unscrew the back panel, you can press a lever that allows the top compartment to come out and gives you full access to the top compartment. With the top compartment, uh, it sort of like slides out uh, like um, like a drawer in a, in a file cabinet. Um, and then um, it gives you just enough room on the top to get to the back of the beauty door and more importantly the back of the lock on the beauty door, which again has Phillips head screw holding it in. So you unscrew that lock using like a ratcheting screwdriver because that's all you have room for. You pull out that lock, the beauty door opens. So now you have access to the top compartment and the safe is still sitting in front of you. But the safe lock is held on from the inside with Phillips head screws. Thank you. So, but how can we get to that? Well, 
the computer on the top needs to be able to talk to the cash dispenser inside the safe somehow. So you have to, you have to cut holes in the safe somewhere for wiring. As it turns out, the hole is about maybe yay big, as in the back. Uh, so from the, from the back of the ATM, there's a hole yay big that you have access to with the back panel removed. And you could snake a tool down in there, and it would have to be a custom tool which we didn't build for lack of time. But you could snake a tool down there, and um, there's this, um, this, I can't remember the name of it, but there's this all, like cord type thing. Uh, I think it's, it's like a series of universal joints, basically, that are all connected with each other. So um, you have this thing that can snake through a pipe, and you turn it at this end, and it turns at the other end. So you can, you can fit you know, like one of these cords through a, a specially shaped pipe with just a screwdriver bit at the end. Work it in there, and then you know maybe have um, what's the name of the the, the quick camera on a cord thing? Um, well, anyway, it's for for doing plumbing work. You can attach one of those so you can see exactly what you're doing. You work your way in there. You unscrew the safe lock from the inside, and then pull the safe lock off. Open up the safe, and retire to Mexico. Um, so it's just a series of disassembly attacks on ATMs, and that. Um, that was not my first ATM engagement, but I did find out that a lot of ATM locks are very easy to pick on my first uh, physical involved engagement. Sure. Any other questions? Go ahead. What can you say about the practicality of bump keys versus some of the attacks you went through today? Um, I've not had great luck with bump keys myself. Um, there was a big media frenzy about bump keys, and in response to that, a lot of manufacturers have uh, put in protections against bump keys, especially on sort of the higher echelons of locks. So if you find a lock that you can't pick, you probably can't bump it either. So while it is an interesting bypass, and it does need to be considered when designing a lock, um, I think that bump keys in general are no more effective than picking. They're, they're, I very, I, I can't actually think of a lock where I could, I couldn't pick it, but I could bump it. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? All right. I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>